Christian, and welcome everyone to, de to today's double act, Jennings and Jennings. Eric and Paul Jennings are, so far as I know, not related, but they are both working on related topics, which is why we decided to uh, yeah, organize it this way today and have a double paper. Uh, let me introduce the two speakers. Uh, Eric Jennings is Distinguished Professor in History of France and the Francophone World at the University of Toronto. He is a leading authority in the field uh, and he has published widely on uh, French and Francophone uh, history. The publications um, that interest us in the project most are perhaps um, Michy in the Tropics, Uh, curing the colonizers and escape from Vichy, the refugee exodus to the French Caribbean. Uh, most of his books have been translated, I think all of them into French, others in uh, some into other languages such as uh, Vietnamese as well. Paul Jennings, Dr. Paul Jennings is a social historian and he has taught uh, history over 30 years at the universities of uh, Bradford and Leeds and the Open uh, University. His uh, research interests uh, focus, among other things, uh, on the history of drink and uh, drinking places. And so he has published, for instance, the local a history of the English pub um, and a history of drink and the English from 1500 to 2000. Now, recently, Paul has been uh, engaged in a project on the working class uh, lives in Edwardian Harrogate. Uh, he has published uh, a book on that subject just now. And this is accompanied also by an exhibition that is running uh, as we speak in the Royal Pump Room Museum in Harrogate. Um, now, Today, they will both be speaking about uh, a topic uh, that comes up in our work every now and again, and every time it does so, we are shocked to see how little research there is and how little knowledge there is about a, a topic which we think is really rather important, and that is the people who keep the spas running, the people in the background, the people who do the work and make sure that the uh, visitors to the spas can lead their carefree and elegant life. So today we will have two papers then, one about the French water women, the water givers in the French spas, and uh, one about uh, the uh, spa workers, more generally speaking, in Edwardian Harrogate. Thank you very much, both of you, for being with us. Well, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Christian, Astrid, and Anna for making this possible. Um, I am going to be presented from uh, freezing Toronto. I'll spare you the, uh, the window here with the meter of snow outside, um, thinking of uh, attending a spa myself at this point to get away. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. I should preface this by saying that um, I'll be revisiting an article that I wrote in French in 2014, which was part of a tribute actually to my late supervisor, Professor Susanna Barrows, who was a wonderful cultural and social historian of France. And when they asked me to participate, most of my work is actually on French colonialism. And this is one of the few pieces in progress that I had that was on metropolitan France. So I've found new material since then, so I'll be enhancing the article a little bit, but the gist of it was already in that 2014 article, which is titled Donneuse d'eau, une profession au cœur du tamarisme français, which is to say the water givers, uh, a profession at the heart of uh, French uh, uh, hydrotherapy. So as Astrid pointed out, the donneuse d'eau or water givers are the people at the heart of this topic. Uh, they are all women. Um, I use the present for a reason. I'll return to the present at the very end of my talk. They still exist, uh, although certainly not in the numbers that they once did. When coming up with this topic in English, I still don't really have a great word for them in English. I've come up with water attendants, but I don't know that that's perfect. So occasionally I'll just refer to the donneuse d'eau in French. So these water attendants or water givers uh, really were at the heart of French hydrotherapy in uh, the 19th and 20th century. 
And to me, this topic rests upon several uh, fields. One is obviously the women of his, uh, the, the history of women and gender. Um, these were young, for the most part, local provincial women who found in this activity a uh, real remuneration, albeit a seasonal one for the most part, because they were only employed as water attendants for the duration of the cure uh, season. In some instances, the most famous one is Coco Chanel, who worked as a water attendant at Vichy in 1906. Uh, the tips and salary that they uh, obtained did help on their social ascension. So it was obviously a means of remuneration uh, first and foremost. The topic touches upon another field, another uh, historiographical uh, uh, dimension, which is, of course, um, the medical history of spas. In the highly hierarchical uh, and ritualized world of hydrotherapy, uh, and especially the water uh, drinking cures, uh, the uh, donneuse d'eau or the water attendant found herself as a key intermediary between, on the one hand, the, the spring, and on the other hand, the water consumer. She therefore finds herself, I would argue, somewhere at the confluence of the sacred and the scientific. Um, she was a key component to ensuring that uh, water drinkers drank precisely the right amount for their cure as she was responsible for handing them the uh, glasses that they uh, used. Now, some doctors, uh, and I, I definitely relied on, on scientific work for this, some, some doctors of the late 19th century in particular actually relied on the Deneuse d'eau uh, for data on uh, the you know, number of, of drinkers who overdrank or underdrank or stopped coming midway through their cure, uh, elements like that. In other words, they were called upon by the medical profession. On the flip side, you also see occasionally doctors uh, heap scorn on the Deneuse d'eau as sort of unscientific, uh, people who are just, you know, superfluous in the, in the drinking process. And of course, uh, there's another dimension to all of that, and that is the history of representations. These uh, women were, of course, remarked, observed, uh, especially by the male clientele of the time who talk about them in everything from songs to poems to journal logs to postcards where they comment on the physical appearance of these donneuse d'eau, who for the most part donned... Um, were made to don rather uh, sort of uniforms that were at the at the intersection of the regional and uh, the uh, hospital like gears of the time. So there was sometimes a little regional touch, such as a hat uh, that would have been in local, say Breton or uh, Auvergnat or Basque uh, uh, style. And this is interesting to me in many ways because, of course. Uh, the spas in France are becoming increasingly popular in the middle of the 19th century precisely because urban people can go to the countryside and to the spa in record time thanks to the railways. And at the same time, this is the, the era when sort of regional costume is being fixed and, and located and situated uh, precisely because it's starting to go extinct. So there's something really interesting happening here in terms of uh, encounter between city and countryside and uh, uh, the gendered uh, here. All right, so these are some of the sort of broader historiographical stakes, but who exactly were these water attendants and uh, when did the phenomenon arise and was it more broad than just the French phenomenon? On the last question, the answer is of course resolutely yes. Um, let me now share my screen, something I should have done uh, from the get-go and uh, make sure that everybody is seeing this. Are you able to see my... yeah? Okay, so this is the first slide I wanted to show you. Some of you may be familiar with this uh, drawing from uh, uh, this engraving from 1798 uh, by Thomas Rowlandson showing, quote, the comforts of Bath. And if you look to the right, obviously this is a caricature uh, with the social commentary, but if you focus your gaze on the right of the image, you see a woman serving glasses that have been placed in a row with uh, various people consuming them, some of them perhaps afflicted with gout, others afflicted with injuries, the whole uh, realm of customers and patients at the spa consuming these waters uh, being prepared and poured by a, a female attendant. So clearly this was happening in uh, uh, Bath in the 18th century. 
Uh, I'll definitely ask my colleague Paul about other uh, British spas in this era and when the water attendants appear there. I do have an earlier example, which I think is very interesting. Uh, this one is of the Gironster Fountain uh, at Spa in Belgium. And the engraving shows a woman distributing water at the spring. And the accompanying text describes that this woman is not only responsible for pouring and handing out the water at the spring, she is also able to predict the weather. So there's something really interesting here in terms of multiplicity of functions of these water attendants in the 18th century. So although I, I can't with any clarity establish a direct filiation between what's happening here at Bath and Spa and what will happen at Vichy, uh, there clearly are antecedents. And there's also, as Anna Corbin and others have argued, a great deal of emulation happening in the world of spas, with some looking towards Carlsbad, others looking towards Bath. And these uh, uh, spas are mutually uh, emulating and even spying one another in terms of uh, everything from architecture uh, to modes of uh, water consumption. So here you have um, some of the uh, uh, sites that I'll be talking about today. You're looking at a water attendant in the center of your image here, taking the water from uh, the Griffon, from the spring. And uh, if you look carefully, you'll see that there's a wall, circular wall that is uh, surrounding her and uh, that she is surrounded by patients uh, slash uh, customers. The first function of a water attendant then is to separate the drinker from the fountain and ensure that this is not a self-service uh, uh, mode of operation. They also embody uh, a, a real medical specialization, not that all of these water cures necessarily treat the same disease, but rather they are only involved in the drinking aspect of the cure. You don't have uh, water attendants uh, supervising uh, water immersion cures or water spray cures, for instance. And of course, in uh, the 19th century in France, uh, water drinking cures were all the rage, uh, not just at Vichy, which you see here, but at countless of the many, many French spas. Uh, this map shows you uh, with blue dots uh, the incredible spread of spas in 19th century France, with, of course, regional concentrations, which are determined naturally by, you know, where hot natural spring water arises, which is to say mainly in the mountainous volcanic Massif Central area of central France, uh, around the Pyrenees and around the Alps, as well as in northeastern France. Although there's a handful of exceptions, uh, notice the ones in northern France and in Brittany, uh, for instance. So you have water attendants, in other words, across uh, the French uh, territory in this era. This is another illustration of two water attendants in uniform at uh, Vichy. The date is unclear. Uh, here they are awaiting the customers, whereas at the last postcard, postcard I showed you, there was a certain affluence. And then very rarely you have postcards that focus entirely on these water attendants. This one, I am guessing, is between the wars at uh, Vichy as well. Um, some of these postcards tell us quite a bit. In some of them, you are able to make out the signs that say things like, the water attendant will sell you a glass if you don't already own one. In others, uh, they indicate that customers are not to rest on the counter. In other words, there is a different, a distance being established here between uh, the water attendant and the patient uh, slash uh, customer. All right, um, so forward here to my next slide. You see a water attendance then in a host of different settings. Uh, there is, I suppose, a certain uniformity in as much as they are responsible for taking water, placing it in, into glasses, and then handing the glasses to the patient. Uh, but the actual, uh, um, the actual scene, if you will, varies tremendously. Uh, this is a spa in Ardèche in southern France, the spa of Vals-les-Bains. And one of the springs, as you can tell, has been set in this faux Egyptian uh, uh, grotto, where you see three water attendants awaiting a customer who is seen arriving uh, on the left. Um, and of course, one of the, the 
points that I'm trying to make is that these water attendants, although entirely a female profession, are one of many professions associated with spas, one of many seasonal activities. One of the others that we encounter in postcards are, of course, these porters shown here. And one of the points of continuity, I suppose, is that in both instances, if you look at sort of early 19th century French sources, you see both these porters and these water attendants first being the servants of individual noble people before the practice became generalized to a bourgeois clientele. So here you have a customer being carried uh, to uh, drink the waters at Neris les Bains. And here, interestingly, you have a dialogue between these different sectors. You have porters bringing a drinker at Hoya to the uh, spring where they are going to drink. So here you have the porters and the water attendants in dialogue around a, a customer. So what you're looking at here is a rare archival excerpt. Unfortunately, these water attendants are what uh, are, are part of what Jérôme Pénez has called the uh, ghosts of thermalism, which is to say these professions that are very hard to reconstitute based on archival sources. And really the few times you encounter them are in the archives are when new codes are set up. Um, and that was of course the case here at Vichy in 1842, when new rules are set up to uh, uh, manage what's going on around the spring itself at each of the different springs. So I've just shown you an excerpt of an archival document here from the Archive Départementale de l'Allier which indicates that henceforth, a two young people cleanly dressed will be tasked with distributing water and maintaining property, uh, maintaining the property uh, near the fountain. That's in one case. In the other case, if you read carefully, you'll see that an actual name is given. Uh, in other words, a family has been hired to do this and, and that, that, that family is also responsible in that instance at the Celestin for a uh, bottling. Uh, some of the water as well. So you see at first that the Dunus d'eau is part of a broader uh, uh, spectrum, and then gradually over the course of 19th century, her activities become restricted to drawing the water and serving the water. Bottling will become its own uh, sector uh, altogether. So one of the interesting features then is that we see uh, certain families of water attendants emerge. There's different ways of becoming a water attendant. One, obviously, uh, Coco Chanel uh, happened to uh, put in an application and get the job. Uh, but in other instances, it is a profession that is passed down from mother to daughter. And one sees traces of this in various 19th century sources, especially around uh, Vichy. So you're looking here at an early 20th century postcard showing a family of de nos do. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly who is the mother, daughter, aunt, whatever, but a clearly a multi-generational family here of water attendants. Also note the glasses in the background hanging, and I'll return to the glasses themselves as an important feature of uh, this uh, profession. All right. I mentioned earlier that um, the actual scene can vary quite a bit. We're back at the spring of Roya. Notice here that the uh, water attendants are actually uh, below ground uh, in that they are in a sort of well. Notice as well the attempt to cordon off the spring itself under a kind of glass jar. Uh, this was very common in an attempt to reduce the amount of imperfection and bacteria that could get into the spring. So there's something else going here in term, going on here in terms of the water attendant as a guarantor of the healthfulness of the water uh, that is uh, being consumed. So um, the glass. You're looking here at a, a graduated glass. Um, often they bore the name of the uh, spring. Uh, so here, this is one from Roya. I lifted this one simply from eBay, but they're legion. You can find them in uh, car boot sales all over uh, France and the world for that matter. Um, and they speak, of course, to this paramedical role of, of the water attendant. They also speak to the intense ritualization of a spa culture. Because of course, what you see on the left is uh, the little holder in which that glass would be kept. So there's different scenarios here. One of which is that drinkers would actually carry their own glass around. In another scenario, the water attendants would keep the glass of the drinker for the whole season and jot their name uh, in a little uh, tag 
on uh, the glass itself. So maintaining the hygiene of the drink cure was a key component, a key role attributed uh, to uh, these uh, water attendants. You see this at work in some of these images. Um, if you look carefully here, you will see not only the sign I was talking about earlier, indicating that these uh, um, glasses are for sale, but if you look here on the shelves, you'll see the many glasses hanging and the Dinus Do here producing the glasses from the spring and bringing them to the crowd that has assembled uh, to uh, consume uh, the waters. We have a variety of sources that, that offer interesting insights into this dimension. Uh, this is one from uh, two doctors in 1862 who write, quote, drinkers can be divided into two categories, those who are disgusted and those who are not. The latter drink the waters in an omnibus glass, which the water attendants rinse off summarily, or which they don't even rinse at all if the spring is too crowded. Those who are disgusted purchase glasses which become their exclusive property in which no other lips will touch. The water attendants will recognize your glass in the heap and will offer it to you at once. In other words, having a very sharp memory is part of the story because even if you have a scenario, let me return to the previous slide, even if you have a scenario like this one, um, you might have an alphabetical system, but you still have to be pretty good at producing this glass quickly at a time of uh, considerable affluence uh, uh, like uh, here. And so one of the things I was able to rely on uh, in my research was uh, countless uh, doctors commenting on uh, the sort of almost ultra modern role of uh, the uh, uh, water giver in terms of ensuring uh, the hygiene if uh, she was doing her job uh, correctly. Part of this again has to do with uh, protecting the spring as you say here and part of it, I'll, I'll get to this in a second, has to do with uh, ensuring uh, proper distance between the water giver and the spring. Sometimes this can be done through a glass protective device. Sometimes it's actually done through the use of a tool, a, a long handle, metallic handle that is used to draw the water from the spring. Again, ensuring the necessary distance we're in a time of contagion. So all of this has some resonance, I think, ensuring the, the, the necessary distance between the hands of the water attendant and uh, the uh, medical uh, waters. All right, so all of this said, I mentioned at the start that we have different kinds of sources that speak uh, to uh, the Deneuse Do. And some of them, um, you know, bring up the lives of, of individual uh, Deneuse Do. Some of them speak to the fact that, you know, they get, uh, they, they get uh, uh, tips at the end of the season. There's different scenarios again here. Um, th these cures lasted something like 30 days, 21 days, depended. Uh, in some instances, you see a drinker's tipping on a weekly basis, very rarely on a daily basis. And then sometimes you see them giving a big donation at the end of the season, which of course the uh, water attendants would remember the season afterwards and uh, uh, you know, produce a, a, an even uh, uh, kinder uh, service. So you, you'd have you know, broader smiles displayed the year afterwards based on the amount of tip produced the year before. So that's clear in a number of different sources. But there's other kinds of sources as well that, you know, explain, for instance, that in, in some springs you have rackets where a lead water giver collects a percentage of all of the tips, if not all of them. In some instances, the spa actually takes a percentage of these tips. So it's, it's a struggle as well, this, this story of remuneration. And some of the sources that speak to, you know, these uh, water givers as achieving instant social elevation are more in the realm of fantasy than anything else. In a sense, it's akin to the job of concierge in an urban setting. It is a small, uh, uh, low-level profession reserved for the most part for uh, provincial uh, French uh, women. It does, however, foster these incredible contacts between, on the one hand, uh, these uh, uh, urban uh, uh, customers and patients, and on the other hand, uh, uh, local uh, regional women. So um, there's many different instances of this. Um, Guy de Maupassant, 
uh, relates in his novels uh, a great many instances of seasonal romances between uh, Parisian men and Deneuze d'eau, including, incidentally, his own, uh, which trickles into this uh, narrative. So, um, again, the, the story is one of encounter as well as this uh, social mobility that I was just referring to. However, an exasperatingly large number of sources uh, simply speak uh, to uh, uh, the attraction of the male clientele uh, to uh, the Deneuze d'eau. And there's no doubt here that um, I, I'm drawing from uh, work of, of a number of historians, uh, but in particular, um, uh, the work of Peter Bailey on Victorian barmaids, it seems to me that there is a sort of parasexuality or glamorized sexuality around the Deneuze d'eau, a kind of perpetual fantasy of the male customer that you see uh, at work in a great many of these narratives. I'll give you one example. Uh, this is a travel guide to Vichy, Clermont, and Roya, clearly focused on central France, clearly focused on spas. And this is the passage devoted to the water attendants. The maneuver involved in drawing the water and the method of presenting the drinking glasses already constitute a very attractive spectacle in themselves. The attendants or the priestesses of the temple, if you will, place the glass in a metal device with a long handle and plunge the two with remarkable dexterity into the center of the basin where the mineral water howls. They then deposit the glass onto a marble tablet along the ledge and present the platter to the client with a remarkable delicate touch and agility. Behind their uniform dress of Vichy textile with large stripes, you will find more than one pretty face. So clearly uh, there is uh, an attraction uh, being described here. There's also an admiration for the dexterity and uh, uh, um, the, the actual sort of ballet going on in terms of the production of the water and it's being distributed uh, to uh, the uh, drinkers. Last but not least, note uh, the commentary on this implement that the Deneuze d'eau utilized. I've tried to enlarge the, the little uh, drawing on the right. You'll see uh, the water attendant holding this, uh, and you'll also notice once again, her regional costume. So this parasexuality is at work, of course, in advertising the spa. The Deneuze d'eau often feature in representations of the spa as a way of attracting a male clientele. Um, but not only, I mean, here you have a female customer interacting with a Deneuze d'eau with or a water attendant. It's not readily apparent at first that she is a water attendant until you look very closely at the image, you realize that she's wearing uh, the typical uh, uniform hat and uh, that she is indeed drawing uh, the water and toasting uh, the uh, glass or maybe even handing it over. Um, and then of course, there's all of these neoclassical references. So uh, you have references to nymphs, you have classical allusions, water giving of course can go back to antiquity. It can be uh, connected uh, to various practices in ancient Rome and Greece. And uh, you have that represented, I think, on a number of posters, including this one, where uh, the uh, classical reference is uh, quite uh, evident. I think you even see it at work in the advertising of Vichy bottles, although the consumer in you know, Lyon, Marseille, or Bordeaux, or Paris isn't going to actually meet a water attendant when they drink this bottle. Uh, they can nevertheless conjure up the image of the water attendant uh, through uh, this uh, Art Nouveau uh, uh, poster. And of course, there's uh, social commentary about the Deneuze d'eau. This is a series of cartoons that appeared in a, a comical a newspaper, uh, Paris-based in 1877. I'll, I'll spare you some of them. I mean, this is quite um, uh, crude humor in some instances. There's one of them about a woman trying to lose weight going year after year to the spa and she doesn't seem to be able to achieve her goal. Uh, there's another a racist one about uh, Chinese people attending the spa which speaks incidentally to the incredible cosmopolitanism of a place like Vichy. And then there's one with no obvious punchline, which is this one. Um, I mean, it's obviously sexist. It's, it reads in French, um, les petites donneuses d'eau accordent vive et retroussées font le plus grand honneur à, à la qualité de leur marchandise. The little donneuses d'eau, so notice the adjective, uh, friendly, vivacious, with sleeves rolled up, they do honor to the quality of their merchandise. But unlike the other ones, there's no sort of joke uh, at work here. 
here, this is simply, uh, I think, uh, uh, a way of leering at the donneuse d'eau. Notice once again that the, in this uh, sketch, you have that instrument, that long metallic handle uh, uh, displayed uh, prominently, as well as the rows of glasses in uh, the background. So in, in terms of you know, visually capturing this as a vignette, it seems to me that there's several elements. Uh, there's obviously the uniform, the hat, the handle, and uh, the glasses in uh, the background. So in that sense, the Donneuse d'eau, the water attendant, is ubiquitous. You see her represented in this very summarily uh, rendered vision in a number of different uh, cartoons. Again, none of them making a particular uh, point so much as associating the water attendant with the cure process. Um, so here you have another one, again, wearing her hat, again, wearing her regional costume, uniform, and again, handing the glass uh, to uh, the drinker. All right, so a, a few more observations about uh, the Donneuse d'eau. One is uh, about this question of uh, cosmopolitanism. So these spas, uh, again, drew uh, an urban clientele, but they also drew increasingly an international clientele. So I've I found a number of sort of American and British and German testimonies of travelers at Vichy commenting on the Deneuse d'eau. Uh, and one of the intriguing things that I've noticed is that by the late 19th century, you have water attendants at American spas as well. So I'm left with sort of a, a theory of diffusion, if you will, uh, the idea being that perhaps uh, Vichy was influential in uh, cloning this career on the other side of the Atlantic. But also you have, of course, um, a, a colonial clientele. So um, what's so interesting about Vichy is that it draws the Sultan of Morocco, it draws the Emperor of Anam, it draws the deposed uh, a Queen of Madagascar, all of them taking the waters. And so in that case, you have this sort of reverse colonial encounter at work where these uh, uh, working class or, or provincial uh, young women are suddenly finding themselves face to face with the royalty of uh, lands that have been recently colonized by France. So there's interesting encounters in that way as well. And last but not least, there's a number of political encounters. So I've found examples uh, around the late 19th century when France is forging an alliance with Tsarist Russia of a water attendance getting into political debates, suggesting that perhaps uh, Russia shouldn't be the best friend of France, seeing as serfdom was only recently abolished, and that the Russian crown doesn't seem terribly uh, sympathetic to the plight of poorer people. So you have all sorts of dialogue uh, being achieved. And politics is what comes to the fore here, because of course, uh, the sleepy uh, spa town, cosmopolitan though it may be, uh, Vichy suddenly become propelled to the status of capital of unoccupied France, in uh, July of 1940, and almost overnight, uh, the government is transferred to the town of Vichy. So to give one obvious example, the Hotel du Parc, which had been one of the more luxurious hotels in town, suddenly becomes uh, the headquarters for the new uh, Vichy government. Indeed, it's not just that hotel. Uh, to give another example, the Ministry of the Colonies uh, sets up shop at the Hotel Britannique, uh, a rather uh, funny uh, uh, name if you consider how anglophobic the uh, Vichy regime is. Um, and so you have all of these hotels suddenly overnight uh, catering not just to drinkers and bathers, uh, but also suddenly to uh, the government. And of course, uh, uh, Pétain, Laval, all of their uh, crypto fascist retinue, uh, these people require a security apparatus. And what this drawing from 1942 is poking fun at is the almost overnight militarization of the city of Vichy, because you have the female water attendants who had been really the brand of Vichy in a sense, suddenly replaced with uh, the so-called presidential guard of uh, Marshal Philippe Pétain, uh, the collaborationist head of state of Vichy. So this would have been uh, hilarious to contemporaries because of course the very point of these water attendants was that they were uh, female, and that they brought a female touch to uh, the water consumption process. And here you have these rather brusque uh, male uh, soldiers uh, taking uh, over. All right, I had been told 30 minutes, so I'm going on a 30 minute uh, schedule today. So I'm wrapping up here, but I, I want to um, 
I, I wanted to suggest that the um, water attendants have um, uh, afterlives, so to speak. Uh, there was a period in the 1970s and 80s, from what I can tell, where um, the spas in France were in big trouble. For one thing, a number of insurance companies were, were ceasing to cover water spas. Um, there was also the, the problem of um, what diseases they were, they were um, uh, considered uh, beneficial for. So a whole bunch of spas in France had catered to so-called tropical uh, ailments, uh, so-called colonial ailments, including malaria, yellow fever, dengue. Well, that worked all well and nice when France had a vast colonial empire, the world's second largest. But after 1962, when that empire has essentially fallen apart, uh, you've lost the whole segment of your clientele. So there was a segment in the 70s where several Vichy spas actually suddenly uh, reverted to self-service, um, which, you know, in the height of the 19th century would have been unimaginable. And then lo and behold, uh, around the turn of the 21st century, I found several sources and now visual ones as well, confirming uh, that the Deneuves d'eau are back. Uh, they are once again a profession. They are once again a seasonal profession for young women only. And they once again wear a uniform. Now, the last uh, reference I saw to them online was from 2019. It could be that the Compagnie des Donneuses d'eau, as it's called, has actually uh, gone out of business. I don't know. Uh, but uh, these are several uh, um, pictures taken from websites uh, recently speaking to the rebirth of the profession of the Donneuses d'eau. And of course, in other instances, uh, they are referred to in art. Uh, these are works by an artist, a French artist by the name of Marc Vera, who does uh, photo montages and collages, and he superimposes present day spa buildings with the so-called nymphs that he has taken from neoclassical paintings. So on the one hand, there's, there's a really interesting allusion to sort of a female presence in uh, the spa, I actually find them problematic in another way, though, which is to say that rather be, than being uh, at work drawing the water and handing it to the customers, in both of these instances, these so-called nymphs are completely idle uh, and are not indeed uh, drawing the water or performing any other task at the spa, uh, so far as I can tell. So again, just to summarize, uh, the water attendants were an absolute central feature of uh, the sociability and the medical uh, side of the spa in the 19th century, as well as providing uh, a real opportunity for a number of young women, uh, especially at uh, the time. Thanks so much for your uh, interest and I look forward to questions after my co-Jennings uh, paper. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Um, and um, I have to share Paul's slides now. So if you could stop sharing yours for a moment, although they are so lovely. Done. Thank you. Um, yes, so without much further ado, um, we move to the second presentation. I have taken notes about the questions that have arrived in the chat so far. So we will return to Eric's presentation um, through some of the questions and we will take more uh, if that uh, is um, demanded, right? But now without much further ado, um, I invite uh, Paul to start his presentation and I will open up his slides. And uh -huh. this is again that I have to shuffle you around here on my screen in order Opa, this was a bit too fast. Okay, this is the first slide and uh, Paul, please. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, let me say, first of all, thank you to Eric for the most interesting and enjoyable paper. Uh, I hope my paper will provide uh, uh, a suitable contrast, if you like, and I take a much broader picture of, of the workforce in this, this particular uh, spa town. Uh, I put my email address up on there. I'm more than happy if, if, if anybody doesn't get the opportunity to ask a question uh, this afternoon to respond to any, any questions that people may have. Uh, and may I also take the opportunity, if any of you are going to be in the north of England, uh, that I'd be more than happy to, to show you the exhibition to which Astrid referred uh, at, the Royal Pump, at the Royal Pumpering Museum uh, with uh, the curator Karen Southworth, uh, who I can see is all, also uh, attending this afternoon. Uh, so as I say, Christine is going to do the slides, so I'll have to say every now and then 
Next, 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 next slide, please. Uh, to proceed then. Edwardian Harrogate enjoyed both a national and international reputation as an exclusive health and leisure resort. As one English newspaper reported in June of 1913, quote, there are many thousands of people in England who regularly at this time of year turn their eyes to Harrogate. Over in Europe, the readers of Berlin's leading newspaper were told that it was, quote, probably unassailable in its position as the leading spa. And across the Atlantic, the New York Times similarly advised those planning a European tour in the spring of 1914 that, along with the newly refurbished Tower of London, Harrogate was the place to visit. Now, the town's workers were an essential part of that success, yet many contemporaries seem not to have noticed them. According to an editorial in the Harrogate Advertiser, that's one of two uh, Harrogate newspapers at the time, in January 1906, visitors had, quote, frequently remarked upon the absence of any signs of poverty and the apparent dearth of the working class element. But the advertiser in that same editorial also noted under the heading Harrogate's Unemployed, uh, a corrective to such a view. For, quote, if those classes do not flaunt their misfortune or existence before the world at large, yet they are present all the same. A similar situation inspired a contemporary study of another place not usually associated with its working men and women, Cambridge. In 1906, Eglantine Jebb published a study of the university town where she then lived, which declared that whereas previous histories and guides had focused on its colleges, churches and eminent men, she wished to know, quote, something of the lives of the many as well as the few. This was one of the inspirations for my research and subsequent writing on, on this topic in Harrogate uh, and this paper this afternoon seeks to do the same for the Harrogate working class. A modern history of Harrogate by yet another Jennings, uh, Bernard Jennings and, and colleagues back in 1970 described the, 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 these people as those without whose labour the town's middle class world could not function and identified five key elements which comprised it. These were the hotel servants and those employed in ancillary enterprises, the shop assistants and the craft workers employed in tailoring, dressmaking or mill millinery, domestic servants, railway workers, and fifth, those in the building trades. But Jennings's book then only goes on to provide a brief discussion of some one and a half pages. And this neglect of working people, certainly in, in uh, English resorts is too, true generally. There is a rare study of the Welsh spa town of Llandrindod Wells, uh, which noted a significant gap in the historiography in regard to the workers in these towns. Another of Bath commented how the working class there, quote, have been so discreetly camouflaged into becoming mere appendages of the genteel class that it is akin to discovering new territory. In England, certainly there have been more studies of seaside towns but with the exception of a study by John Walton of the Blackpool landlady, uh, they share this neglect uh, with workers, generally speaking, appearing as visitors to resorts rather than as workers. Perhaps the most famous depiction of, of, of workers in a resort town is, is a fictional one written at, written at the time. Uh, this is by Robert Tressel in his The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist, published in 1914. His Mugsborough, as he called it, although not itself a seaside town, uh, was based on the genteel coastal resort of Hastings and Tressel's own experience there of the building trade. At various points in my own research on Harrogate, I have to say I was reminded irresistibly of Tressel's town. For example, the close links between employers and the town council or the charitable efforts of the well-to-do at times of economic distress. Uh, although, of course, it is a novel, uh, in which, in Tressel's own words, his main object was to write a readable story full of human interest. But to anybody not familiar with it, I can uh, commend it as a study of workers from one who had been himself a building worker. For those of you not familiar with Harrogate, I've just got a few slides to begin with uh, to, to illustrate an outline of the town's history. Uh, Harrogate's waters uh, were publicised. Uh, discovered as is usually described uh, from the year 1571. Uh, this first slide is, 
is where that first well was, the Tewit well, uh, which is a contemporary word for a, uh, a peewit, a, a type of bird. The canopy over it is a, is a later edition moved from another well, uh, but this is, the, this is the original spot. Uh, Harrogate has almost 90 different varieties of water which come to the surface, chiefly calibites or sulphur, notably the latter at what was called a stinking spa for obvious reasons. Uh, from fairly primitive beginnings, then the town developed a resort and by the later 18th century, chiefly at the instigation of the town's hoteliers, the waters were protected by the creation of the stray. Next uh, slide, please. This is the in incomparable 200 acre area of open land which surrounds uh, the, the central part of Harrogate to, to this day, despite many efforts to build on it or to utilize it for various purposes. It's still uh, a great uh, beauty and attraction to the town. Private developers then undertook the further exploitation of the waters, together with the provision of accommodation and entertainment, including, next slide, this uh, promenade room of 1806, uh, which is now the uh, Mercer Art Gallery in, in Harrogate. Following a threat by one hotelier to the integrity of the public supply of sulphur water, uh, a new local government body was created, next slide please, and in 1842, its first act was to open a new royal pump room over the old sulphur well uh, of 1842, as you can see. The, the extension to the left was added in 1913, but that is substantially uh, the original uh, pump room, which is now the Royal uh, Pump Room Museum, which I've mentioned. Thereafter, uh, both public and private development created the modern spa town. Uh, culminating in the, in the state of the art Royal Baths of 1897. Next slide, please. This is the, the, the Royal Baths there. Uh, a core in 1903. Next slide, please. Uh, this, of course, was renamed the Royal Hall during the First World War, but uh, they've now removed the, uh, the cover so that you can see the word core again on the, on the top of the building. Uh, and there are new. Uh, really grand hotels like the Majestic in my next slide, uh, the, the Crown rather, which is a, a rebuilding of an older one, and then the, the Majestic Hotel, the, the, the largest, as you can clearly see, uh, hotel in Harrogate, which opened in 19, 1900. So that was one reason for the, for the chronology of my study, that this period, as you can see, so many great buildings built in such a short space of time uh, has often been regarded then and subsequently as Harrogate's uh, heyday. But whilst the spa was, was central to, to Harrogate's economy, uh, Harrogate also developed, and this is very important for, for, my, for my paper, paper today, uh, as a residential town for wealthy retirees, for those on private incomes, and for commuters to the nearby industrial cities of Leeds and Bradford. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the geography of the north of England, although many people in England aren't that familiar with it, uh, but Leeds and Bradford uh, are within 12, 12, 15, 20 miles of Harrogate and were crucial to its growth and were equally crucial to its subsequent development, uh, both for people retiring to Harrogate, both for people living there on private incomes and for, and for commuters. Uh, Further serving them, both as residents and visitors, Harrogate developed as an important regional retail centre. And finally, to its Edwardian economy, it became home to a range of institutions, obviously those connected to health, but also, and in particular, private schools, such that by the Edwardian period, there were over 600 children boarding at, at around 30 private schools uh, in Harrogate and the, and the immediate neighbourhood. Indeed, there's, a great, there's another fascinating project to be done about this private school world in Harrogate at the time. Uh, I think I'm up to speed with, this, with the slides, Christian, but if you'd like to go to the next one, I'll remind myself. Now, uh, this is a nice contemporary one. Uh, looking down the stray uh, towards, you can see the, the Crown Hotel there. Incidentally, the, the 
the uh, writing on the back of this asks the, the reader what father thought of the sinking of the Lusitania, uh, clearly dating this, this postcard to being sent in the, in the spring of 1915. Uh, just the next one then, please, Christine. I think that's, yeah, we're okay for the moment. Yeah, leave that one there, please, for the moment. All these developments in the economy, the, the town's workforce supported them. So I'll examine for the rest of the paper its various components and say some uh, something about each in turn. First uh, was the importance of the work of women. Uh, throughout the Edwardian period, over 40% of the working population uh, were women, compared to a national proportion of some 29-30%, and more of the town's women worked than was the case nationally. This is due in large part to the importance of service, the lot of around 3,000 women and girls in any given year. Occupations almost exclusively carried on by women also included laundry work, cleaning, and dressmaking or millinery. Women were also well represented among shop workers, as we'll see. Most of this work was also some form of service uh, or for other women, both long established as areas of women's work. My second overall point is men's work in contrast was dominated by the building trades and transport of all kinds, from the railways to cab drivers. This is a similar employment, for example, that one finds in the study of Bath. Other areas of importance for men were work in the gas industry, in some form of municipal employment as gardeners, for example, or in hotels. The world of work then was, was highly gendered, with the minor exceptions of printing, bookbinding, upholstery, which employed a small number of women, only hotel and shop work and parts of the clothing trade were carried on by both men and women. Work, as, as Eric also commented, was also often seasonal, clearly in relation to the spa facilities, but other occupations, particularly dependent, at least in part, on the season were cab drivers, bath chairmen, the errand boys, of which there were large numbers in, in Harrogate, who carried or took messengers and carried goods, street hawkers and entertainers, to whom I'll return, and the laundry trade. The weather, of course, was a crucial dimension of seasonality, affecting the building trade, uh, the gas industry, gardening and the clothing sector whilst the latter was also subject to the vagaries of fashion. Uh, and for example, the death of Edward VII, uh, which uh, required the sudden uh, making of large amounts of uh, mourning wear. As Stedman Jones in his famous study of Outcast London noted writing of the London building trade, very few workers could expect a working life of stable employment in the 19th century, and Harrogate is no exception. A third feature I'd like to note of the town's labour market uh, was the opportunities it afforded to what John Benson has called penny capitalism, uh, where a working man or woman went into business on a small scale uh, in the hope of profit, but the possibility of loss, and made him or herself responsible for every facet of the enterprise. Trades that this might cover, uh, described in the census as working on their own account, included tailors, cobblers, upholsterers, French polishers, watching clock repairers, or those in the building trade finding their own work in small jobs and repairs rather than working for an employer. The same was also true of gardeners in Harrogate, many of whom also described themselves in the census as working on their own account or jobbing, to use the contemporary phrase. Street entertainers were another group, making the minimal investment necessary to set up as an organ grinder, for example, uh, and similar considerations apply to women in, in domestic laundry work, as well as cleaning, charring, as it was known then, taking in lodges or basic re retailing. And my final overall observation is of the great heterogeneity of working class employments. Uh, in retailing, for example, on the one hand, you've got a high class James Street store like Marshall's, Marshall and Snell Grove. James Street, if you like, was Harrogate's classiest street uh, at this time or a little corner shop in a working class district. The building trade was similarly divided into several different trades, each with differing fortunes. And finally, the railway industry was also characterised by great status consciousness with the elite of engine drivers at the top, uh, down to shunters and so on at the bottom. 
Similarly, hotel work had its clear hierarchy, clearly differentiating a head waiter from those under him and certainly from the kitchen porter and the rest behind the scenes. So now for the second part of this paper, then I'll, I'll focus on some of these groups of Harrogate workers. And that my first slide shows the sadly unknown uh, Harrogate uh, servant from the period. This is by far the most important occupation for women in Edwardian England, uh, and more markedly the case in a residential and leisure town like Harrogate. There were over 1.7 million female servants nationally at this time, and as I said, around 3,000 in Harrogate. They worked in a range of settings, of which the most important was the private household. But others worked in hotels, public houses, boarding and lodging houses, shops and institutions such as private schools, orphanages, hospitals. In total, they represented in 1901 40% of working women in England and Wales, but 55% of uh, those in Harrogate. The importance of service within the local economy was reflected in the proportion of servants per thousand families, which the 1911 census calculated. Uh, this was 170 nationally, but 348 per thousand in Harrogate, comparable to other inland and seaside resorts like Buxton, Bath or Bournemouth, just to use the letter B or in residential suburbs. Uh, the largest concentration of all being Hampstead uh, in North London. Around seven out of 10 of Harrogate's servants worked in private households, well ahead of the one in five in the accommodation sector. And the single servant was the most common situation, covering under, just under two thirds of servant keeping households. Uh, while conversely, just under 40% of servants worked alone and a further third worked with just one other servant. This is quite contrary to the popular image fostered in uh, the television series like Downton Abbey of a, of a large household of servants. Studies of other towns similarly show the solitary servant to have been quite, quite typical. Uh, Around a third of servants gave themselves a specific designation in, in the census. I'm rather assuming that you're familiar with the UK census. Forgive me, forgive me if you're not, but I haven't really spaced to go into how, how those two censuses of 1901 and 1911 were done. Uh, but over 2,000 girls and women simply, sim simply were described as maids or general servants or domestics. I did some work which I can summarize briefly today on on the backgrounds uh, to these young women. Uh, for example, you can, look at the, you can look at their birthplaces. The great majority have not in fact come very far from their place of birth. In both census years, around a quarter had been born in Harrogate or within around 10 miles of the town. Overall, around two thirds had been born in the county of Yorkshire and of those from further afield, half had originated in the three adjoining counties. Despite the common assumption that servants were typically country girls in Harrogate, most in fact were not. One in 10 were born in large cities of over 50,000 inhabitants, particularly Leeds, York and Middlesbrough. And among others born in Yorkshire, half were from towns and others from industrial villages, particularly industrial villages in, in the Durham or South Yorkshire coal, fleet, coal fields and in the villages surrounding the iron and steel town of Middlesbrough which are now part of the, the Middlesbrough accommodation, a com, conurbation, I beg your pardon. Areas, of course, which had limited employment for women compared to the textile towns like Bradford, uh, from which comparatively few domestic servants came. And that's an important point that I haven't got time to go into today, but given almost any alternative, women preferred that to working as domestic servants. As one might expect, most of these servants came from working class backgrounds uh, and the wide variety of backgrounds suggests that service was an option for a broad range of families. Fathers, for example, included building and railway workers, gardeners, grooms, coachmen, labourers and policemen, uh, miners, uh, an electoral plater from Sheffield and a ship steward from Hull, quite a cross section. Of the, of the mothers where the mother was living alone, just under half were themselves in some sort of service, charwomen, laundress or cook. 
uh, of higher social groups, only farmers and publicans are represented. Being a girl among many siblings was also important in deciding whether the girl went into service as they were much more likely to come from large families of six or more children. Uh, finally and briefly, whereas most servants came from families, there was also a significant minority who'd been brought up in some kind of an institution, workhouses, orphanages, what were called industrial schools for what either semi-delinquent or what, what we would nowadays call problem children, or from rescue homes. The rescue of young women from prostitution or immorality of their prevention, prevention of them falling into it, was a major concern of late Victorian and Edwardian philanthropy. And such a home was set up in Harrogate in 1905 by the local Prevention and Rescue Association. Uh, and its reports of 1911 to 12 noted that they'd dealt with 35 rescue and 24 preventive cases with a further 14 maternity and five quote drink cases. 28 of these girls had been placed directly into, into service. Uh, and place was usually by prospective employers applying direct uh, to these rescue homes or to the industrial homes uh, looking for servants who were in big demand at this time uh, for reasons I haven't got time to go into to today. As well as domestic service, servicing a wide variety of hotels and accommodation providers, private schools and institutions, as I say, was also predominantly female. The sole exception to this was hotel work. Uh, the proportion of live-in hotel staff who were women fell from just over, just under, just over to, rather to just under two thirds over the decade. That's more than 300 women in each year. Those hotel workers who lived out, out of the premises were almost all men. I should say that this, the census <coughs> in 01 and 11 was taken just before the season commenced. So these figures don't reflect how many hotel workers that would have been at the height of the season. Uh, and the hotel staffs de designate their servants under a much more varied range of specific occupations. Hall and corridor, hall and corridor maids, for example, lounge, lounge maids, and so on. Uh, if I may go on then now to, to, to laundry work. While some schools and institutions and hotels did their own laundry, there was also a substantial commercial sector, both for hotels and for private households. The number of women described in the census as doing laundry work on their own account at home, i.e. domestically, fell slightly over the period, but the number of laundry workers almost doubled. This reflects the, the great expansion of commercial industrial laundries from the late, from the late 19th century. And in the Edwardian period, there were several such laundries in Harrogate. If you can show the next slide, please, Christian. Uh, this is one of those in, in Harrogate, the New Park Laundry, uh, for which there are a terrific series of photographs showing the various processes uh, of laundry work. Uh, now subdivided uh, in a commercial setting from sorting, washing, drying and ironing, uh, through to uh, pr uh, the actual preparation of the, of the laundry to be sent out to houses and hotels. As I'm at pains to stress in the book, which I haven't time to, to stress here, a lot of this work was incredibly hard. And laundry work, although it looks almost demure in this photograph, uh, the women were very prone to a variety of ailments from the working conditions of steam and heat and the physical consequences of constant standing varicose veins, leg ulcers, rheumatism, bronchitis, and inflammation of the hands and arms caused by the soap, soda, soda rather, and other chemicals used. Uh, I'll just move on slightly so I can see the, the, the time moving on. Uh, shop workers, if you'd like to go to the next slide, Christian, but another important element of the, of the Edwardian Harrogate workforce. This is it, one of the more upmarket uh, uh, Harrogate Enterprise. This is Emmett's uh, mantle makers and costumiers showroom of, of 1900, showing the mannequins and the staff. Uh, 
And although in Harrogate there were always more male assistants than women, the growth in shop assisting was greatest among, among women. Uh, sh shop work itself was largely gendered. Uh, women worked in, in dress and drapery, boots and shoes, confectionery stations, news agents and bookstalls. Uh, but men uh, in such as grocers, fishmongers uh, and butchers. Another area for women that increased over the century, over the decade rather, uh, were women working as waitresses in cafes and west restaurants whose numbers doubled over the period. This again was incredibly hard work. Shop assistants worked for up to 75 hours a week uh, in the Edwardian period, uh, six days a week, up to sometimes 10 or 11 uh, on Saturdays. Finally, in my work, I had a, a brief look at, at what's sometimes been referred to in studies of spas, but only referred to, that's prostitution or sex work, as it's often now called, uh, as another source of income for Harrogate. Contemporaries were certainly aware of, of this. Uh, one clergyman said in a speech to the Prevention and Rescue Home, quote, many who came to Harrogate, alas, did not enjoy themselves in an innocent way. I then examined the newspapers and found something like uh, 25 cases of uh, women who were taken by the police for soliciting over the decade of the Edwardian period, uh, which shows it very much to have been a part-time occupation by, by working class women, uh, several of whom in fact gave their uh, residences of no fixed abode. But turning now to men for the, for the remainder of my time, uh, the transport sector, looking briefly at, uh, at uh, hotel work, uh, just if I can just, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I'm just, briefly noting the, the time. If I can look first of all at the hotel staff, because it's an this is an interesting dimension I'd said in the abstract I would look at. Uh, half the hotel staff at this time were actually from Europe, 35 men in 1901 and 57 in 1911, over a third of the total male hotel workforce, of whom in turn two thirds were of German or Austrian descent. At the Crown Hotel, which you saw in the slide, for example, the four cooks were respectively two Germans, an Austrian and an Italian. One of the kitchen porters was Italian, the luggage porter Swiss, and the waiters Germans, Austrians and Italians. There were also a further 30 European workers living around the town, like head waiter Hermann Valentine from Hamburg uh, with his English wife and three children, the youngest of whom had been born in Harrogate. Waiting on tables, however, was the most common employment by the Europeans, especially for the Germans. Uh, as, 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 as you probably know, as waiters, they, they, ha they often had the advantage of formal training, including some who were sent to England by the, the owners of hotels in Germany and Switzerland as a form of apprenticeship and the ability to speak a foreign language. They, they no doubt also added a certain <coughs> continental flair to men and we frequently to be found in hotels in London and in citizen resorts around the country. Their presence, however, this has been documented, aroused hostility in this country. Nothing new there, sadly. And in 1910, a loyal British Waiter Society was set up with its own newspaper, which aimed to provide, quote, employment for British waiters who are reliable and loyal. But the main sectors of employment for men in, in Harrogate uh, with the building trades. Uh, in 1901, 22% of employed men were in building, 15% uh, in the next sector, uh, transport. But over the, the Edwardian period, the building trades uh, suffered quite a marked setback. And 10 years later in Harrogate, those positions had been reversed with transport now occupying the larger number of, of workers. Although residential building continued into the Edwardian period, it was never on the scale of the late Victorian, early Edwardian period. And the building workforce therefore contracted from 
1,343 to just over 1,000 in a single, single decade. Uh, the transport sector was also uh, the key employment sector. It facilitated commuting and the import of goods and, of course, the, the visitors to the town uh, and the commuters to Leeds and Bradford. The total number of men employed was by over a third over the decade to 465 in 1911, of whom something like 70% lived in one small suburb of Harrogate, uh, which uh, effectively was a railway town. Harrogate nowadays would never be thought of as a railway town, but it was like Crewe or Swindon, such a town in the 19th century. And as I said, the railway employment was, was very much status, very much male. The only women in the entire sector were two female lavatory attendants uh, and very much hierarchical between the, the railwaymen at the top uh, down to the porters at the bottom. Uh, this is also reflected in the wage structure, which I haven't time to go on to today. But one thing I would like to, to point out is, uh, is th this was still a dangerous occupation in the Edwardian period. Nationally, in 1906, for every 10,000 men employed, eight were killed and many more injured on the railways. Uh, and Harrogate's experience was quite typical. To, to quote just one, one example, uh, William Hattersley, a shunter, the most common type of work to, to result in injury or death, was hit by a train. And the census in the following year shows his widow taking in washing to provide for their daughter and two sons. Uh, and he's also sharing a home with a widow's sister and her two-year-old son. Uh, one thing also with, with, with transport is uh, the shift in, in, in transport the town towards motorised transport. There's quite a marked reduction in the numbers engaged in, in, in transport of a horse-drawn nature towards motorised transport, either as chauffeurs uh, or of, as uh, taxicab drivers. And one other area of male employment I'd like to comment on briefly, as I've mentioned it two or three times, were, were street musicians. If you can, I think I've missed the railway men for whom apologies, but uh, they're the building workers and the railway workers. And let's pause at these, these street musicians. This is, this is Otto Schwarz and his German band who came from the Rhineland Palatinate, a German state known as the land of musicians from its tradition of sending men throughout Europe to perform. These were trained professional musicians with a repertoire including classical and folk music, as well as marches, waltzes, and contemporary music hall tunes. They first turned up in Harrogate in 1898, after which they were regular performers in the town's hotels, at the Corsal, and at various outdoor locations, such as this one uh, below the, the Prospect Hotel. They also did charitable performances, notably in 1912, giving an open air concert for the victims of the Titanic disaster. Uh, Otto's friend, the violinist Wallace Hartley, uh, had led the ship's band on the Titanic uh, and Otto had attended his funeral over in Lancashire. Uh, Otto and his band at this time were renting a house just three doors down from our own home in Valley Road, Harrogate. Uh, uh, we then find him there with his wife, Amalie, uh, their little boy Berthold, plus his brother Gustav and four nephews. And this together made up Schwartz's band. And it was from here in August, 1914, that the whole lot of the male, uh, the men were arrested uh, and taken under police and then armed guard uh, for internment for the rest of the First World War. And another group of street musicians, the next slides, please. We're not moving. The next, the next, the next slide sh sh should be Italian street musicians, uh, who were a notable feature of England's towns and cities from the late nineteenth century. And these are Italian, an Italian street musician in in the Harrogate, the Edwardian period. Uh, 
this group did not enjoy the prestige, however, of bands like Schwarz. Uh, and legislation in 1893 had given control of the stray to the, to the town council. And they also took powers to regulate entertainment, particularly street performers. Under, the, under one section of the act, any householder or, or his servant notably, uh, either directly or through a police constable, could require street musicians to move on or risk, risk arrest, uh, as indeed a number of were, a number were in, the, in the Harrogate period. Uh, including a number of Italian street musicians illustrating the dim view, uh, certainly which so, some authorities and certainly some residents uh, took of street organ grinders. They faced, in, in truth, something of the hostility that German waiters, uh, German waiters had faced, although they were certainly popular uh, with other Harrogate residents. Of course, there, were, there are many other groups of workers. Uh, I deliberately haven't focused on those people working for the, for the spa itself, like the water dispensers that, 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 that Eric, looked, Eric looked at, or the other spa workers, such as masseurs, uh, masseurs uh, the attendants at, at the baths, for example, or even very specific occupations which appeared in the census, like, like shampooers. Uh, and much more detailed work could be done about those people, people in Harrogate. But I, I hope that the paper has given uh, a picture of, the, of what were, of course, the majority of, of Harrogate residents, uh, the workers in the, in the, in the industries uh, of a major spa town like Harrogate. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Paul. Um, as promised, um, we will now open. I, I stopped Sorry, the sharing. The final of, slide, Chris, Christian is there. Oh, there's no, a final one. Slide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it, yeah. It just All right. The Perhaps, the um, um, while we prepare for the discussion, we leave that uh, slide on for um, a little time. I've noted quite a number. Um, of questions from the chat already. Um, uh, qu quite a few of them are quite uh, factual, actually. Um, so there were, to um, Eric's presentation, there were two questions by Thomas uh, van der Dunk. Um, he wanted to know the first postcard, Eric, that you showed, uh, from which year that was, um, and um, yeah, perhaps the, the second question I invite Thomas uh, to comment on himself, because uh, I think Eric later on in his talk returned to the question of what happened uh, to the Don, uh, Donneuse Do um, in the, yeah, in the 21st century, broadly speaking. Okay, so I, I the, the short answer is yes, I think that's the same spring. And as for the Donneuse Do in the 21st century, um, one of the things to keep in mind about Vichy is that there's, a, uh, there's dozens of springs, right? So the one that had the return of the Donneus d'eau was uh, Célestin. Um, and I believe a whole bunch of others are self-served. So um, there, there's, yeah, there's differences there. Nor did they all cease at the same time. I talked about the 70s as a period of decline, uh, but I, I don't think each one dropped their Donneus d'eau overnight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I can contribute that. Um, stopping over um, over the last 20 years uh, regularly at Contrexville because it's so clear close to the motorway. <laughs> they still have donneurs do um, not around the clock, but sort of in, in normal business hours as well. Thomas, do you do you want to to add something to that or? No, I think the, the question was uh, is answered. Uh, the first question was indeed when the picture was taken and perhaps for the most of the picture of Fiji, were they from before the First World War or were they from after the First World War? Yeah, they're, they're almost all from before. Almost before, ah, yes. That's what I want. With the exception of the one where they are sort of wearing, uh, the, there's a, one where you see the three donors do together. They look like they're in the 20s, 30s. Yes, later, yes, like all 34, yeah. so yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question, in fact, is answered. Yes, so from the 17s on, there, uh, those uh, those water assistants are, are disappearing rather. Yes. 
gradually as the popularity of cures themselves uh, begin to dip. And, and the, the, the popularity of drinking cures in particular, in some instances, you still have, you know, massages, uh, hydrotherapy, you know, water therapy, balneology, all of that, but no longer the drinking. Yeah, no, no. no when I was there to drink, uh, I think there was nobody there to, to serve. <laughs> right. At the, at the big, uh, the, the, the big spa in Fiji, the central one. Yeah, but perhaps we can follow that up because one of the interesting things is obviously um, the function that uh, Eric ascribed to the donors that is uh, being kind of a regulator and also a kind of barrier between the, the greater public and the source needed to be taken into account. So the mechanization uh, of the business um, created a new kind of obviously solutions which uh, again are perhaps not totally sustainable from plastic glass, um, well, Call it glasses, bakers, <laughs> yeah, um, cups to to these kind of um, very high techy uh, kind of tap uh, machines where you can sort of tap your own water nowadays. Um, I think sort of the the, the, the basic problem uh, still exists. Okay, I have another question um, which I couldn't really place um, from Caroline Yeo, um, and she asked about. Um, something when, when you were presenting a, a source from France, whether there was a link to a German brand that was still marketed. Um, is she still around perhaps to uh, address this question herself? Yeah. We, we can't hear you, Caroline. You have to switch on your microphone. There we go. Is that better? <laughs> Hello? Hello? No, I can hear you. Oh, no, no, it was the um, the, the Belgian, the spa, the spa that was it. And I lived in Luxembourg for a while and um, quite regularly drank and bought and drank uh, Gerolsteiner bottled water. And I just wondered if that was the same, the same spring. I, I believe it's the very, I, I thought it was the same one. I'm not sure. Ah, uh, right. I should imagine it is, but it was just. Because your your um, postcard was in French, a, so we'll have to ask a special a Belgian specialist. <laughs> yeah, we could ask Mark, but I don't know whether he wants I to saw intervene. Hand, I saw the question of I the brands. Of the... Go up. <laughs> yeah, I'm just guessing, but um, I think all the um, spa waters are under the brand of Spa Monopole. You know, with the little mm -hmm. Piero clown. Was that the same, um, Caroline? It, no, no, the oh. um, Gerolsteiner is in green bottles. Okay. Um, I think it might be different because spa is very much all that, you know, all the springs come under spa monopole as far as I know. Uh, okay, thank you. And it's a different, it sounds as if it's a different spelling as well to this. To well, it's the a spelling. German spelling. Yeah, oh, I see, right, okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so this is a fantastic uh, topic, obviously, the drinking of, of waters, the bottling of waters, and uh, what happened actually in which waters were bottled and how they were marketed. And this is actually um, a question very much in flux. I um, uh, read a, a, a remark uh, in the German press this week that they stopped distributing um, the brand of Vitel, which belongs to a bigger Swiss company nowadays Nestle um, so um, this is this is a very complicated uh, topic in its own <laughs> right I'm afraid and we should perhaps then move on to other questions that I've noted and the last question I've seen um, uh, asked while Eric was presenting was the question of the recruitment of the donors um, you mentioned some some aspects like the kind of family business the generational kind of question but uh, Henrique's question was whether that was a local and regional um, recruitment exclusively. I do think it was local and regional. So that it was even the case for Coco Chanel, right? So it was basically local networks that got her recruited. In other instances, as I said, it was a single family that was in charge of one of the springs at Vichy for a good part of the 19th century, for at least 30 years, the Jerome family. So um, you do have these local regional networks and most of the hiring was done on location, uh, which created the seasonal employment for these local provincial women. Um, and it also highlighted, I mean, in addition to the local 
you know, hat and local outfit that was integrated into the uniform, you would also have therefore had a local accent, right, which would have heightened the notion of local charm. So place, I think place matters a great deal with mineral waters, and it matters a great deal with the water attendance as well. I did want to highlight, though, that this is, I, I faced a real problem with sources, right? There's a lot of visual sources. But on the social history of the spa attendants, the archives are virtually silent. So, um, you know, people who've worked at the Compagnie Fermière tell me that there's no individual files that are accessible on the Donneuse d'eau. So it becomes very hard. You can do a little bit of oral history. Um, you can work with the press, which I certainly did. Um, as I said, in the archive, in the departmental archives, I found regulations about what the Donneuse d'eau could and couldn't do. Uh, but if you actually want to get, you know, details of their lives, it becomes much more challenging, with the exception of what I'm sharing here, which is spectacular tragedies, like Adonis Do was crushed to death when uh, the um, pavilion uh, over the waters uh, uh, collapsed here in Châtel Guyon in 1909. Um, but other than that, it becomes very uh, challenging to, to reconstruct um, individual trajectories. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I suggest there was um, a question again from Carolyn on the how long the exhibition is going to be opened in Harrogate and I would simply ask one of the colleagues from from Harrogate to perhaps enter the answer into the chat so everyone can find it there and we can uh, move on uh, to the next question in the chat which I try to do now. Um, hang on. This is not so easy at the moment because there's so little space left on, on my screen here. Um, there was a question from, yeah, I, I can't uh, tell you the full name, Fiona, um, which is probably um, not the, the real name. Um, well, was there sufficient employment opp opportunity in Harrogate to accommodate workers in the off season months? That's to Paul, obviously. Yeah, uh, the answer the answer to that question first first of all is as I, as I said in relation to the to the hotels the census was taken immediately prior to to the season uh, at the very end of April or, or at the very beginning of June so it, it, it's very difficult then to get a, a picture of the workforce whether it would have been significantly different in uh, in July or July or or August. Uh, my, my impression is that, that, that Harrogate is a place that, that can absorb uh, lots, of, uh, lots of people coming into the town for work. Uh, the, the 1911 census uh, analysed uh, to, to what extent towns uh, had, a resident, uh, had a population which had, been, which had been born there. And Harrogate was very much a town, town of incomers. Uh, that's true of the middle class population, and it's certainly true of the, of the, the working class population. This is a place that's attracting uh, attracting people to, to, to come into work. Uh, second, uh, this is also a place to which people are coming to work uh, on, on a daily basis. Uh, the town of Nesma, for example, is only a, a relatively short walk from Harrogate, very short railway journey. Lots of people came in daily from uh, from Harrogate, from Nesbury rather. Include, for example, one of my families of Italian street musicians actually lived in Nesbury, which was cheaper, uh, where the rents were cheaper, and came, came, in, came into Harrogate uh, uh, to work. Uh, again, I didn't, didn't document that aspect because if somebody's described as a laundry worker in Nesbury, one doesn't know whether they're doing laundry in Nesbury or indeed coming into Harrogate. So my, my figures are based on the on the on the Harrogate population. The short answer to your question is it, it's impossible to know to what to what extent people moved away uh, in, in July and August uh, as unable to find work. Clearly, over the decade, the, the number of building workers uh, declined. So s some of those building workers will undoubtedly have, have, have moved to other places. But then the building trades declined, declined throughout throughout the whole country. So some of them will also have found work work within Harrogate. I noted, for example, that the number of jobbing gardeners increased over the decade. It's possible to surmise that that some of those building workers 
were forced to, to seek work uh, as jobbing gardeners are in, 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 similar, in similar work such as that. So I'm conscious that that doesn't provide you with a, with a clear answer to the question, what, what happened in the off season? Uh, what happened finally, I'm sorry, this is a long answer, what happened in, in periods, periods of unemployment, there were two periods of quite high unemployment in Harrogate, was that people stayed put and were reliant on relief works by the, by the council. The council provided uh, work on the, on the sewerage system to, to the unemployed uh, for, for hundreds of men. So uh, th these were men who must have been laid off, like, like the building trades, who stayed where they were and uh, had to rely on this kind of relief or in extremis on, on charity and on, 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 on the poor law system. Uh, but there's, there's not evidence that I'm aware of to suggest that there's a large scale emigration of, of, of men in, for example, building trades because there's no building work anywhere else either. So that's a long and perhaps not wholly unsatisfactory answer, but I hope it's given some, some insight into it. Yeah, and there's, there has been a bit of uh, discussion of the answer and the question in in uh, in the chat while you've been okay. talking. So um, I think sort of uh, Thomas' question about uh, work in winter has partly been answered by you already. But there were also uh, there's um, um, a question comment by Mark from Spa who says. Uh, is there like in spa a summer season and a winter season? Some workers like the musicians or casino employees were going to Nice in winter. So circulating between the spas. Yes, there's the, 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 the certain examples of that. The, the, the Schwarz group, uh, whose photo I showed you, were only here for, were only here for the season. Uh, and uh, other groups of musicians, which I've looked at similarly, were only here for the season. The, 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 the lowest rank of entertainers, if you like, the, the Italian musicians lived here. They, they, they were present throughout, uh, throughout the year. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as you can find, for example, in, 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 in school records. Uh, Harrogate was very conscious of its reliance on the, on the season and made several efforts to try and, to try and extend the season. For example, work, work in the, the railway, persuading the railway companies to offer cheaper off-season tickets to persuade people, persuade people to come, uh, and th this is taking place uh, from the later 19th century, so that th th there would be a, a much longer season. But the evidence from the census of late April, early June, for the number of people in hotels, suggests that th this hadn't taken off particularly by the Edwardian period, since there are comparatively few uh, people resident in hotels and boarding houses on census night. And the UK census required you to be recorded where you actually were. There's no provision, uh, as there is in the modern census, to record where you would normally have resided. If you were in a hotel in Harrogate, you were recorded as in a hotel in Harrogate. Uh, so the answer to the question is, yes, the, 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 they were conscious of the season and efforts were being made to, to extend it, but it seems to have had relatively limited success at this period. Yeah, perhaps we can sort of um, close this discussion. It's obviously one of the key issues when you think about um, employment uh, at the spa, whether it's direct employment by the spa or um, in the kind of um, community around it. But um, suffice to say, perhaps that Harrogate in some respects is perhaps rather an exception to the rule being located in a kind of industrial agglomeration where there's a lot of employment, different types of employment, whereas let's say thinking of German or French spas, very often they are rather peripheric in their location where perhaps then uh, larger types of migration uh, would have to be factored yeah, I, I, so as, I don't think you can overstate the importance of having two big industrial cities like Leeds and Bradford so close, uh, both to its growth, growth as a spa and to its growth as a residential uh, commuter town. Yeah, um, I, I want to move on because there are uh, another in, or a few other interesting contributions in the uh, chat. Uh, first of all, um, indeed, sort of Henrike from the spa project reminds us that uh, very recently um, we've seen um, only in last year that some of our um, uh, associated partners like the Spartan of Bad Oyenhausen has simply resumed serving um, water from the tap and employing 
uh, uh, water attendance there. Um, there is another um, um, contribution from Catherine Lloyd, uh, who informs us that there was a very interesting um, exhibition about women in spas uh, at the tourist office in the town of Spa. So um, perhaps look for uh, material that is still available uh, about this um, uh, exhibition. Has there been a catalogue or something that is uh, perhaps uh, still available? I haven't, Spa? I haven't seen one, Christian, but I've, yeah. it's, it's on my list of things to do. I must, it's reminded me, I must ask them for any proceedings from the, from the exhibition. Yeah. Um, but they were certainly looking for, for examples of women that worked in spas as well as the women that visited the spas. Very good. Um, and I, I, I use this, this opportunity to sort of uh, advertise the, the, the local history society that exists in spa, which has a very um, interesting journal that um, appears four times a year. Um, and um, I, I am pretty sure that you can find uh, a lot of articles there on women and on also female spa attendants uh, in that journal. Um, I go further down the list, uh, also from Catherine, the information that um, in But Kissing and Two, we see um, uh, Donneuse Do um, coming back. Um, then, okay, this was somebody from Franzensbad or Frantisch Korvelagene telling us that she has to leave. It's, 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 it's really good to see how how transcontinental and pan-European this uh, seminar has become. Okay, then uh, Mark's remark about the summer season, the musicians we already discussed. Aha, Thomas is still um, uh, wanting to uh, react on some of the question or comments. Thomas, please. Uh, yeah, uh, I was already writing, but I can tell it now also shortly. I asked a question about winter and summer. I made some study of Burg Steinfurt in this 18th century. It's not a spa, but it was an amusement park developed by the Count of Steinfurt. This is in Westphalia, a small town. And he had organized it that way that in uh, winter, the, the inhabitants of the town could build new amusement attractions. And in the summer, they could host the guests. So that, that's the reason I, I asked that perhaps there could be some local economy to have all people work the whole season. That was my, in fact, the reason that I asked. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, the, um, I think it's Simone from the Historic Thermal Towns Association who um, contributed the next uh, remark saying that um, some of the, the members of that organization, like the uh, like Shav in, I'm, I'm not quite sure about the pronunciation, in Portugal has uh, still uh, water attendance and butt kissing in two, and she will term, definitely double check with we she because due to the pandemic there might have been a replacement uh, of these jobs temporarily. Then comes Eric. Okay, <laughs> I see some. Uh, signs of envy and dialogue between France and Germany concerning water and tenants in the early 20th century. Can you sort of um, perhaps expand on that a bit, Eric? Well, of course, after 1870, Franco-German competition is in the air. Absolutely. And uh, there's an attempt <laughs> from French spas to recapture the audience of French elites who were going on the, to the other side of the Rhine to take their cure. Be, or, you know, this englobes actually Austria and the Austro-Hungarian Empire as well. There is upset about Karlsbad as they are about Marienbad and Baden and you name it. Um, and there's a sort of renationalization of the French spa. And one of the ways of doing this is to vaunt the charms of the French donneuse d'eau as opposed to the Austrian and German ones. So this is part, becomes part of an advertising strategy to reconquer, quote unquote, um, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the sector that was leaving. All right. Okay, we'll have to, to, to look closer at the German promotional material as Jens Jürgen is still with us. Perhaps he can sort of counter with some examples from Bad Ems. Uh, we'll see to that. Um, definitely uh, worth uh, checking in terms of uh, the entanglements of spa history across the continent. And I have another question from my colleague Henrike, um, which is um, directed towards Paul. And she asked, did the spa workers, especially given the physical stresses, have access to the healing waters and treatments at times, for example, when paying guests were not attending? 
If you're asking, by your question, I take it you mean that the people I've been talking about, the laundry workers and shop assistants and so on, uh, the, the short answer is that there are no records which I've ever seen that would allow one to, to answer that question as, as to whether some of the people I've been looking at had access to the, to the same uh, treatments that the, that the visitors did. Uh, the, the census gives you the details of people who were patients in, for example, the, the, the Royal Bath Hospital, uh, which is a big, big hospital in, in, in Harrogate. The, 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 those people are almost invariably uh, of middle class occupations and from places other than, other than Harrogate. The only, the only hospital setting where you find uh, Harrogate residents and people with working class occupations are, are those people who are actually in the town's infirmary on census night. In other words, in, in, in the in the in the basic in the basic hospital, uh, I would incline to think not, uh, but the, the, the evidence doesn't exist for me to give a to give an answer to that specific question. As Eric, as Eric said, uh, we're, we're lacking employment records. Uh, employment records for these people all, all i have about <clears throat> workers yeah. like the, the water attendant and so on are the bare facts of uh, given in the census where they were born how old they were and, and so on yeah thank you sort of there's <laughs> there's just a flurry of exchanges now um after my um re uh, question to um hans jürgen Zahot, who um unfortunately has no microphone so he can't join uh, the discussion, but I'm sure um, if we look at his publications of Bud Ems, we will find also some uh, information because he has actually um, a quite extensive chapter on uh, the local um, people in the town. So it's a, it's a larger history of the town in which the history of the spa is, is just the part. Um, down, then there was a question by Eric about the German equivalent to Donus Do, and uh, here Hans Jürgen and uh, Simone um, answered uh, almost at the same time uh, that there is the German term Brunnenmädchen, fountain girl, uh, which is quite widespread. Um, and before I forget it, because I skipped over that, I mean, um, Karen Southward from uh, um, Harrogate offered uh, that she had um, illustrations of Harrogate uh, Donneuse d'eau for Eric. So Eric, if you don't mind, I'll pass on your email so that Karen can send them to you. Okay, thank you. Please, I'll right. just send my, I'll send my email to the whole group because I realized I didn't do it in my presentation. So here it is. I look forward to hearing any feedback you might have and to continuing this dialogue. Yeah, this is um, wonderful. Thank you. So um, are there still questions or comments uh, that are burning? that we need to, um, aha, okay, so here, here come the next, uh, the next um, comments and questions in the chat. It's Henrike first who says, to the spa workers and their access to waters and therapies, they, this is reported in popular spa fiction, for example, in Annelie Jordal's A Summer at Augustenbad. Literature sometimes seems to fill the gaps in the sources. And uh, yes, I mean, um, you, you uh, both have been also um, referring to fictional kind of treatments um, in literature. And Mark um, adds, in, 19th century, in the 19th century, you can find water attendants from uh, Saratoga Springs to Yesentuki in oh. Russia. Yes, that's true. So um, it is indeed um, a uh, one one of the the kind of symbols of of, of spa culture that definitely uh, deserves um, more attention. And uh, yeah, Mark, sort of, um, if you have any references to share with Eric, I guess he's happy to do so, and you can do that uh, in uh, whatever language uh, I think you prefer. <laughs> I don't know, Eric, can he write in Flemish? <laughs> no, but I can read German. Okay, so yeah, then that's fine because Mark's German is perfect. Okay, thank you. Thanks um, everyone. Any other comments, questions? Otherwise, uh, we 